Hello, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is part of a series of webinars on how to expand the power of 3D to the design, development, and manufacture of products made from soft, flexible materials. Our topic today is how 3D to 2D digital patterning and 3D bonding optimizes soft goods fabrication. This is potentially a transformative way to improve how you create and produce your products. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded and we will provide you with a link so you can watch again and share with your colleagues. Next, the webinar is in listen-only mode. If you have questions, we encourage you to please use the chat feature at any time. We will do our best to answer your questions as they come up. Finally, if this webinar piques your interest, we will provide information at the end on how you can look into this topic further and evaluate if this is right for your business. We are going to try to keep this to under 33 minutes, so please feel free to stay in the line until the end. Now that that's all done, let's get started. We took a survey, and as it turns out, everyone is busy. It's probably safe to assume that everyone on this call is being asked to get more done in less time. What we're going to show you today is relevant for industrial produced soft goods across a variety of categories. Before we begin the demonstration, I would ask you to consider at what threshold of improvement making a change would be worth it to you. If you could reduce your time taken by one half, is that enough? Is the priority reduced cost or perhaps reduced labor effort? 3D design digital pattern making, and 3D bonding are part of our marketplace's overall transformation to digital. So in each of time, cost, and effort, the savings can be quite substantial. Now, let's take a look at the workflow. It starts with 3D design. There are four steps in the 3D to 2D digital pattern making workflow. They are shown at the top. Prepare mesh and cut lines, flatten 3D to 2D, validate accuracy, and export DXL file for cutters. We'll show you this workflow in detail. The 3D bonding workflow also has four steps. They are shown at the bottom. Mold design and tooling, placement of parts in the mold, bonding injection, removal and finishing. Our product example today is a shoe that was modeled in 3D. At this point, I'm gonna have my colleague, Luke, from Exact Flat's product development team, walk you through a demonstration of the process. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to respond. Hello and welcome to this video. Uh, in this video, I will be showing you how to flatten uh, inlay elements for a shoe. Uh, this particular shoe is going to be constructed from uh, injection molding. So the blue plastic is injection molding. And all these black pieces here are... Um, inlay elements that will be inlaid to the injection mold. Uh, this particular shoe also has uh, uh, like a knitted uh, woven uh, sock liner that goes on the inside. Uh, but for this demo, we're only going to be looking at the uh, black elements here, this element here, this element here, and there's the fourth one on the other side. Uh, we're only going to be dealing with the inlay elements. To begin, uh, we are first, uh, we're, we're going to create meshes from these different elements here. Uh, the standard exact flat workflow is to join all the surfaces together first, but because all of our inlay elements are completely isolated and separate from all the other elements, there is no need to join anything together. We are simply going to create our meshes. So our mesh preparation stage is going to be uh, fairly simple for this model. So to help keep everything uh, neat and tidy, what we're going to do is first I'm going to collapse all these other layers here. Now I'm just going to create a new layer and I'm going to call it mesh. It's best to keep all your data on separate layers. So this model is very well uh, designed. Everything is on separate layers here. So it, it's best to keep up with that practice. That way, uh, if you ever need to find or turn off uh, pieces of information, it's very easy to do so. So we're going to start. We're just, we created a mesh layer. Now we're going to select our different components here. And we'll rotate around to this side as well. We've got our fourth right here. 
And all we're going to do is we're just going to use the Rhino mesh command. And this is going to help us create a, very, uh, a mesh to start with. So uh, the three most important elements of the mesh command are the maximum aspect ratio, or how long the longest edge can be, uh, how much longer it can be compared to the shortest edge. So we're going to set, uh, usually a maximum aspect ratio of two is a good value. It means that the longest edge can be twice as long as the shortest edge. Um, so this is a very good starting point. Uh, our minimum edge uh, length we're going to set to one. And our maximum edge length is going to be set to 2. These values are always going to change depending on the size of your model. For this model, we're working in millimeters, and if we start to get a bit of a sense of scale here, uh, shoe isn't a terribly large uh, item, so um, having each quad about 2 by 2 millimeters is a very good sampling point. We want to have a very even sampling point across the entire surface of the mesh. So we're going to start with 2, 1, and 2, and we'll hit preview. And it's kind of hard to see, but we can see we've got our grid, our, our gray mesh quads down there. And this is a very good distribution um, for the shoe. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to click OK, and we're going to accept our meshes. So our meshes have been created at this point, uh, but they were created on the layer that the surface was on. So we're going to use the cell mesh command to select our meshes. And now we're just going to modify the object properties for the meshes. We're going to place them on the mesh layer. And once they're on the mesh layer, we can simply turn off the other three layers. So now we're only looking at the objects that we're going to be flattening. Right now, we're in a rendered viewport, which uh, is a little slow, makes it a little difficult to see what we're doing. So we're just going to click the down arrow, and we're going to go to shaded viewport. This allows us to uh, see the meshes much better. So at this point, we've got our meshes with quite a few triangles here. And we're going to continue on with the standard pre-processing phase of exact flat. So we're going to create another new layer. We're going to call it remesh. And what we're going to do is we're going to, again, use the cell mesh command. We're going to select all our meshes. And we're, going to ins uh, we're just going to create a copy of them and place them on the remesh layer. That way, if there's a problem with the remesher or we have to uh, redo the remeshing, we can simply come back to the original mesh. We can copy them again, and we can remesh the copies. So we're going to use the copy to layer command. And we're just going to create copies of these on, on the remesh layer. So now we'll make the remesh layer active. We'll turn off the mesh. So again, normally the, the standard workflow is we'd join all our surfaces together. We'd mesh them. We'd explode the mesh. And then we'd recombine all the individual mesh elements together to form our pattern pieces. With this model, our meshes uh, are, were all created from single surfaces, and none of them actually touch each other, so we're, we don't have to do any of these normal steps. So we're just going to proceed straight to the adaptive remesher. So we're going to switch over to the Mesh Tools tab of the toolbar, and we're going to start the adaptive remesher. And as always, we're just going to click the Start button. We're going to get a feel for um, how the uh, adaptive remesher is going to treat this mesh. And as we start to look at it, we can see around the, the toe of the shoe, we're, we're losing quite a bit of fidelity. We've got very large triangles here, and especially when we come around to the back side here, this used to be a nice smooth uh, curve. It, it's been uh, truncated down to just a, a point. So we definitely want to modify our adaptive remesher tolerances. So we're going to slowly reduce these down. We're going to try dropping this down to 2, 2, and 2. And we can see our estimated vertices right here. This is the results of our first remesher. We're going to click Start again. And um, we're going to end up with more vertices this time, but we, we still don't have very good fidelity. We've gotten a little better down here in the corner, but not good enough. So we're going to drop these down even further, 1, 1, and 1, and we'll click Start again. And we're going to repeat this process until we get a better result. So we're looking better in the toe, but these corners here still aren't really good enough. So we're going to try 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0.5. And we're still getting a little better, still not good enough. So we'll try 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1, and we'll see what kind of results we get. So now we're starting to get a message here. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. We're getting it because one of our meshes has an estimated vertex count over 1,000. So we'll click Yes, and we can definitely see we've got the fidelity we want here. However, we've got quite a few triangles all the way across the surface, probably more triangles than we need. So what we're going to do is we're going to back off the surface tolerance. So we're going to change this to, to 1. So we're going to keep our desired boundary tolerance. So this controls the fidelity of the edges of the mesh. 
we're going to keep that at point 0.1 because we want that detail along the edge but our, we're going to allow a bit more deviation on the surface so we'll click start again and hopefully our our vertex count has been cut in half but we've preserved the fidelity along the border of the mesh so we're going to go ahead we're going to click OK and accept this at this point our mesh preparation uh, phase is complete so we're going to go ahead and we're going to start to flatten this to do this we're going to switch over to the tools tab the exact flat toolbar and we're going to use the very first icon. This is the select pieces for flattening icon. And using this, we can just rectangle select all of our meshes, press enter on our keyboard, and that is going to produce our flat patterns for us very quickly. Uh, good standard practices. We're going to turn or make the pattern layer the default layer, and we're going to simply turn off our 3D reference model and our original remeshed mesh. Lastly, we're going to minimize or uh, reduce our perspective viewport by double clicking on the uh, viewport title and we're going to maximize the top viewport by double clicking on the top viewport title. Now we can simply move the camera around. We're looking directly down at the pattern instead of uh, trying to look at it in a perspective view. It just makes it a little easier for us to uh, see the pattern here. We're also going to ensure that we're in shaded mode and we are. However, we can't see the, the triangulation of the mesh and that's probably because the triangulation highlight is off. So if at any point uh, you're not seeing your triangulation, we can just switch over to the highlights tab and we can click the second icon here. It kind of looks like a knife blade, but this turns on or off the edge highlight. So we can click it once, we'll turn the highlight back on. If we click it again, we turn the highlights off. So we're gonna leave it on just to, it makes it a little easier again to see. Uh, exactly what we're doing here. So as we look at this mesh here, we can see that uh, our pieces here and here are fairly low strain, judging from the color. We use color to indicate the amount of strain on the pattern piece. So white is no strain, blue is 5%, green is 10%, yellow is 15%, and red is 20% more. So just based off the color, we can tell that we've got fairly low strain pieces here. However, this piece and this piece, they do have fairly high strain on them. When we look at this piece, we also see a lot of plus marks on there, and these indicate the presence of folds or wrinkles. So the pattern has actually folded under itself. And this is characteristic of our uh, pre-flatteners and exact flat. Exact flat is a two-stage flattener, being that we do our flattening in two different steps. The first step being our pre-flatteners. They're very, very fast flatteners, and they're designed to very quickly get a flat pattern. Um, and their primary goals are to, first and foremost, remove folds and wrinkles. So in the case of this one here, our pre-flattener didn't remove the folds and wrinkles, so we're going to have to try a different pre-flattener. And the second goal is to reduce the strain on the pattern piece to as close to zero as possible. The less strain we have on a pattern piece when we optimize, our optimizer is our second stage flattener, the less strain we have, the quicker the optimization process is going to go. So when we used our flatten command, we simply used a projection flattener, and obviously for these two pieces, that was not the best flattener. So we're going to try one of our other flatteners. In this case, we'll try our fracture flattener, and we're simply going to click on an edge along a plane of symmetry, and for this piece, we end up with a fairly decent pattern. We'll use fracture again on these, this piece down here, and again, we end up with a, a really nice looking pattern. So. In the case of these two or these pieces here, uh, we've used the uh, first stage flattener, our pre-flatteners, to accomplish both our goals. We've removed all folds and wrinkles from the pattern pieces, and we've reduced the strain to a very low energy state. So at this point, we're going to go ahead, we're going to use our second stage flattener, our optimizer, and we're going to reduce the strain uh, even further. We're going to refine the shape uh, to give us our production quality uh, final flat pattern. So to do this, we click the spring icon to start the command, we select our pieces, and we're going to press enter on the keyboard to accept our selection. At this point, we have our spring uh, settings or options available to us. So the most uh, common option that will be changed here is the material settings. So in exact flat, we actually use the mechanical properties of the different materials to do the flattening. So exact flat comes uh, standard with about 85 different materials. So there's usually something very similar to what you're using. 
as one of our materials. However, uh, if you don't have a, a good fit material, we do have a material editor that allows you to import your own material data. We do partner up with a couple of universities that can do the material testing data. It is very inexpensive. It's about 25 US dollars per material. And with a turnaround time of about five business days, uh, you will receive a report. And using that report, we can create a mathematical material model for use in ExactFlat for you with ExactFlat. So for this demo, we're just going to accept our cotton material here. We'll go ahead and we'll click OK. And uh, we're actually going to turn off our preserved boundaries. We will talk about this option in a little bit when we uh, start looking at the results of the optimizer. So for now, we're going to accept our settings as is, and we're just going to go ahead, we're going to click OK and start the optimizer. So very quickly, we're going to start optimizing here, and we can see for this piece, we've already reduced the strain uh, significantly. We've, uh, the color, just by looking at the color, the color is our primary indicator for how much strain is on the pattern piece. We can see that the color has gone from uh, cyan to pretty much all white. So that tells us that our strain level is very, very close to zero. For this piece here, we're actively optimizing it right now. We're at about 42%. We can see that the, the piece is, um, has, has gone to pretty much all very light blue. So this tells me that our strain is under 5% for this piece and dropping. And as we look at the optimization or spring status report, we've got a different piece of information here that also help us determine the fit and quality of the pattern piece. So probably the most informative piece of information is going to be the average energy density. And this is uh, a measure for the average amount of strain on the pattern piece. So any value below at or, or below one is generally a very good uh, fitting pattern so in this case we've got one newton meter here which is a, a very acceptable level of strain and again we can kind of corroborate this based off the color we can visually uh, visualize it and see that we've got under five percent strain and depending on the material you're working with um, this is a very acceptable amount of strain for the pattern piece Another very important piece of information that we can uh, gather from the optimization or spring status report is the no seam stretch error. So we're we're on our, our third piece now. So with the no seam stretch error, when we think of our, our 2D pattern piece, the 2D pattern piece is created from flattening a 3D shape. So when we take the global perimeter of the 3D shape, the no seam stretch error is the difference in perimeter length between the 3D perimeter uh, and the 2D pattern piece perimeter. So generally speaking, the 2D pattern piece is going to be uh, have a, a, a bigger perimeter than the 3D model piece. So the no seam stretch error is basically the difference between the two perimeter lengths. So the closer to zero they are, the, the better the fit the pattern is. So we can see for this piece here, I, I think we're optimizing this one right here. Our, our boundary length uh, of the piece is 206 millimeters and we've got a no seam stretch error of just about one millimeter. So our 2D pattern perimeter length is about one millimeter larger than our 3D model perimeter length. So that Again, uh, when we when we look at that value combined with the average energy density of 0 0.03 newton meters, and we compare that to the the color of the piece here, in this case we, we've got very 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 light blue. That's indicating to me we've probably got about one percent strain. The all these three pieces of information combined are very good indicators that this pattern is a very high quality production ready pattern, and we could just cut this out and it's going to fit. So at this point we've finished optimizing all four of our pieces, so we can go ahead and click OK to close the spring status uh, report. The last step is to uh, produce a pattern that we can send to a cutting table. So before we do that, we're just going to arrange some of these pieces here. Uh, we can simply do this by just uh, dragging the pieces using standard Rhino commands. We can move the pieces. We can also use the Rhino rotate command. So we can uh, simply uh, rotate the pieces to give them uh, an orientation that uh, is a little more expected. So we can just use any of the Rhino commands to move these around and arrange them however we want. Uh, we can't use the exact flat find tool because none of these pieces have associativity. When we look at the reference model, 
Uh, I'll just bring that up real quick here. We can see that there's a physical space between all the pieces. So there's no associativity, there's no sewn seam data between any of the pieces. So we can't use the find tool. That only works when we have pieces that are uh, joined together or aligned and, and touching. So um, for projects like this, we simply rely on existing Rhino tools to rotate and uh, move the pieces around. So once you have your pattern aligned the way you like, we can go ahead, we can create a pattern or a DX for the uh, for this pattern so this is done uh, the best way to do it is to use the exact flat DXF exporter and actually before we do that we're gonna go to the exact flat options and we're going to go to the DXF export options and for this piece because these are going to be inlays we're, we're gonna make sure our seam allowance is set to zero we don't want any kind of seam offset for these pieces here we're also going to leave our edge type set to polylines we do also support uh, exporting as uh, spline and uh, arcs in those cases will interpolate uh, a spline along the perimeter so that has uh, if your cutting table supports splines that has a nice way of uh, smoothing out the imperfections um, that are introduced by uh, meshing the object and for some cutting tables they uh, prefer arcs and lines so we can also export to that as well but for this one we're going to stick to polylines and we're just going to export uh, polylines so we'll go ahead we'll click OK and now we're going to click the DXF export button it's the third button in the toolbar and we're just going to create a new DXF we already have a DXF here called shoe we're just going to overwrite that file so we're going to click yes and overwrite it so at this point we flattened our pattern and we've created a DXF so lastly we're just going to import the DXF so this is the file we just created. We will import this back into the document and we can compare the patterns um, that we've created here in the DXF to the 3D model. So when we create our DXF, our DXFs come with uh, again different layers here. So we've got a grain layer and when we look at the pattern pieces they all have um, uh, a horizontal line on them. So with exact flat, the horizontal x-axis, or if you're looking at your construction plane, this orange or brown line here, this is always going to be your grain direction. So if you can rotate your pieces however you want, so long as the horizontal line is aligned with the grain of your material, and that's always going to be your grain direction. We can also override this by manually adding a grain line. And this allows you to select any edge, any of the triangle edges, to act as your grain direction. In that case, that will be the orientation of your grain line when you export your pattern piece. We also have a cut layer and seam layer. In this case, because we entered zero seam allowance, both our cut layer and our seam layer are directly over top of one another. So what you can do is if you uh, don't need both, you can simply edit your DXF in uh, Rhino and, and delete one of them. Or when you import this into uh, whichever pattern making software you're using or cutting table, you can simply turn off one of those layers or not assign the tool to them. So you have a couple different options there. So at this point we've flattened our piece, we've uh, optimized it and we've uh, created a DXF pattern and we validated that the shape holds true to the uh, mesh. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you Luke. Now let's take a look at the 3D bonding workflow. Before we do, I'd encourage you, if you have any questions about Luke's presentation, just drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. The goal is to take a product digitally designed in 3D, such as in the picture on the left, and produce a real product, such as in the picture on the right. 3D mold design and tooling are very common in today's manufacturing, but this topic is beyond the scope of our webinar today. We'll start in the middle of the workflow. Pattern pieces that are developed and cut are then assembled by placing them in a mold. Here's a short animation of the process. Once the pieces have been placed accurately in the mold, the bonding agent is applied. Let's take another look at the process. First, the pieces are placed in the mold. Once securely in position, we can now apply the bonding agent. If you have any questions about the process, just go ahead and drop them in the chat. 
We'll do our best to answer them. Once the injection molding and the bonding is complete, the part is removed and finished into the final product. Next, let's take a look and talk about the costs and advantages of the process. The first result you can expect is better quality. Compared to traditional sewing, which creates perforations, 3D bonding is stronger, lasts longer, and waterproof. Lower cost is another result. In this example, labor time is reduced to one-third of traditional processes. Manufacturing cost is reduced by approximately $2.87 per unit. This cost comparison is traditional processes in overseas markets like Vietnam with bonding processes based in the United States or the European Union. Lastly, by producing in domestic markets, shipping, duties, and tariffs are eliminated. Overall, the savings are about 33% for this example. When changing your processes to digitally enabled 3D design, 3D to 2D digital patterning, and 3D bonding instead of sewing, you can expect transformative improvements in your products with respect to speed, it'll be faster, cost, it'll be cheaper, and quality, it will be better. Okay, let's answer some questions. Alright, first question is, where and how is 3D bonding being used today? Well, the technology developed and patented by Simplicity Works is already being implemented in footwear manufacturers. It's also being evaluated for use in making other products, such as bags or automotive interiors, for example, the manufacture of dashboards, door panels, and seats. Okay, next question. How do you ensure the accuracy of the pattern for complete shapes? It's a good question. Well, exact flat flattening is a simulation and pattern optimization which is tied to material properties. The material properties are characteristics of the material that describe how it stretches and sags. Exact flat takes these characteristics into account when converting from 3D to 2D, and the result is accurate flat patterns. All right, next question. What is the minimum quantity in terms of units? Typically around 10 to 15,000 units depending on the product and the materials. This is a mass manufacturing uh, process and the tool sets around it are for mass manufacturing, certainly with respect to 3D bonding. If you're doing prototyping uh, with exact flat, you can produce units of one. Next question. Looks like the example showed in Rhino 3D. Can I use other software if I don't use Rhino? Yes, yes you can. Exact Flat is available for Rhino and for SolidWorks. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. What's the cost? Well, uh, with respect to digital patterning, the software starts at around 8,000 US dollars or about $400 a month if you finance it in the United States. For 3D bonding, um, it's necessary to know more about what you're looking to do. The best thing is to contact us after the webinar. We'll be happy to discuss pricing based on your specific circumstance. Next question. Uh, can you walk through the process to implement 3D bonding? Sure. So first, the uh, digital pattern review with the experts at ExactFlat is the first step. Next. Simplicity Works performs a feasibility study of 3D bonding implementation by product, market, and cost-benefit analysis. All of this is done as part of the special offer we'll be describing in a, just a moment or two. Then if the project is viable, both companies engage in a collaboration agreement or a prototype phase for the product development and go-to-market readiness. Once a prototype phase is complete, a license agreement is prepared, and then you start to take advantage of the benefits of digital patterning. And I will have a little bit more about that getting started process in just a moment. But I hope that answer kind of um, helps you to frame the, 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 the way in which you would, you would take the next steps. Let me talk about the special offer. If you're interested in knowing more, we do have a special offer for webinar attendees. 
it is in three parts. Part one is we review your process. Part two is we develop an automation vision. And lastly, we give you a demonstration that automation vision and run a sample set of patterns through it. You can take these patterns, you can cut them, compare them, and make sure it works for you. It takes about 17 and a half business days total time elapsed, or around three and a half weeks, and usually costs about $7,995. But today, for attendees, it's free, no cost at all. Simply email us at exactflat, uh, that is sales at exactflat, pardon me, sales at exactflat.com. I'll say that again. Email us now at sales at exactflat.com to get started. Many thousands of companies have already expanded the power of their 3D investments. We hope this webinar on digital patterning and 3D bonding has been helpful for you. If you have additional questions, as I mentioned, you can email sales at exactflat.com. I will type it in the chat box for your convenience. On behalf of the team here at ExactFlat and the team at Simplicity Works, I thank you for attending and good luck on your journey in improving your own productivity. Thanks, and that will conclude our webinar for today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.